I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to bring the message today on my word for the year. And uh, I'll be sharing that in just a few minutes. I encourage you to get your listening guide out. And it would be my joy to talk to you about the word vision today, my word for 2014. Pastor David and Rachel are this weekend celebrating their 35th wedding anniversary together. So we celebrate that with them. And uh, it's a joy to be a part of the team with Pastor David. And of course, we celebrate the family and their family especially, and so thankful for them. And I encourage you, as always, to pray for your pastor and pray for his relationship with Rachel. They're a wonderful, wonderful couple and wonderful friends to Betsy and I, and just a, a great relationship they have. So for them to have this weekend to do that is a wonderful thing. And I want to take a moment of personal privilege and be able to introduce you to somebody who's super special to me. Um, I've, I've been married for uh, 30 years or something like that, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I, I uh, met Mimi when I was 16 years old because I started dating my wife when I was 16 and she was 15, and Mimi came into my life then. She's my wife's grandmother, and she is here with us today. She's 96 years young and here with us, seated over here halfway up the ramp, if you believe it or not. Mimi, would you stand? God bless you, Mimi. What a wonderful, wonderful woman of God, and I'm so honored to have her in my life. Open your Bible to the book of Habakkuk, or if you're like me, maybe you need to start at the table of contents, look up towards the end of the Old Testament. You can also pick up a pew Bible. It's on page 785 in your pew Bible. Don't be embarrassed if you didn't know where it was. I had to put a little tab in my Bible to find it, okay? Habakkuk chapter 2, the second chapter of Habakkuk. We're going to read three verses together and then talk about this word vision and the vision that Habakkuk had. I'm going to invite you, if you will, please, to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Would you please stand? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. And I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so me, he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Pray with me, if you will, please. God, I ask in the moments that follow that you would speak clearly to each of us. I pray that the experience that Habakkuk had would be true in each of our lives, that we would follow his example and be able to to experience what he experienced as he encountered you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So my word for 2014 is vision. Vision is, is seeing a picture of the future that helps you move through today. I believe that God has a plan and a purpose for all of us. Regardless of what brought you here today, maybe you're a regular here at the church and this is where you always are. You're seated right in your usual places, I can tell. Or maybe you've wandered in here for the very first time today. Or maybe it's your second or third time. And you're kind of seated anonymously and just kind of trying to kick the tires and see what God would have to say. I want to encourage you today. God has a plan for every one of us. He has a plan and a purpose for every one of us. And my desire and his desire for you is that you would discover and embrace his plan for you. God wants us to discover his plan. He wants us to embrace his plan. I would even add he wants us to experience fully his plan. Maybe you want to write that word out next to that in your listening guide. Experience his plan. Helen Keller said, worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. John Maxwell says, the poorest person in the world is not the person who doesn't have a nickel. The poorest person in the world is one who doesn't have a vision, doesn't have a sight of what's coming, doesn't have a view, a picture of what's coming. 
when we have vision, when we see a picture of the future that can draw us into the future, it helps turn a job into more than making money, but it helps it turn into creating fuel for ministry. It helps turn success into influence. It helps us be more about than just good grades, but about opportunity. It's less about a promotion and more about favor. It's less about ourselves and more about our place in the grander scheme of life and God's purpose for us. You know, in this passage of Scripture, Habakkuk's at a, at a peculiar and difficult time in his life. He's supposed to be representing God, and yet things aren't going so well for Judah. They're under oppression, and things are looking to get worse. In his life, he sees that bad things are happening to all the good people, and good things are happening to all the bad people. And, and those who are serving God and wanting to do right are, are experiencing injustice and being falsely accused and, and not getting the opportunity that they deserve. And those who are disclaiming God and discrediting God are getting advancement and getting opportunity and granting favor with people all around them. And in the midst of that confusion where it looks like God's not paying attention, Habakkuk says, God, I have a... The Bible uses the word complaint. Some of your translations just say question. He goes to God and he says, how can this be? Are you paying attention? Are you awake? Maybe today, maybe you find yourself there. Maybe there's inequities. Maybe there's something at work that just, it's just the right person's not getting the opportunity. You've done everything right and it's just not working out to your favor. Or maybe there's a challenge at home and children whom you love aren't following Jesus like you've wanted them to. Or even worse, there's a relationship in their life that's debilitating and it's hurting and it's creating, wreaking havoc in your world. Maybe, maybe you've been falsely accused and you're walking through an ordeal that doesn't make sense or, or maybe even you made a bad choice. You did something that wasn't right, but now it seems like the punishment that you're paying is way beyond the, the bad that you did. And man, God, surely it doesn't have to be this way. And Habakkuk found himself there. He writes these words. And he says to God, the, I'm, I'm going to have an experience with you to help me answer and wrestle with this question. What I need from you, God, is a vision, a picture, a portrait of the future. I want to know, Habakkuk is saying, I want to be clear, God, that my future isn't like my past, that I have something out there that can draw me into tomorrow, that I can move forward. No matter who you are today, God invites you to do the same. Move forward. Your future doesn't have to be like your past. We can experience the same, same experience that Habakkuk had. There's three steps in his process that I want to talk to us about. And, and the first one is found in verse 1 of chapter 2. The first step was he watched for it, for vision. You got to watch for it. You got to look for it. You got to watch. In verse 2, it says, I'm going to take my stand at the watch post and station myself on the tower. I'm going to look out to see what he'll say for me. And wherever Habakkuk's post was, the prophet went there to withdraw from normal society and concentrate specifically on God and on what God would say when God decided to speak. So my question is, where, where do we go when we got to hear from God? Habakkuk went to a watch post, a sentry tower, probably on the wall of the city or or maybe a place he was very familiar with. Some scholars say this is probably somewhere that he regularly went to hear from God. Where is the place you go to hear from God? For some of you, it's, you're, here, you're sitting in the pew right now where you hear from God on a regular basis. That's why you come. It's because you need to hear from God. For many of us, it's, it's here, but there are places beyond here. And I want to encourage all of you to have a place beyond the pew you're sitting in where you regularly hear from God. And maybe it's a, 
a quiet chair at home where you can go and open the Bible and read and hear from God. I like to go to our back porch. If I can steal some quiet out there and close the door so nobody comes out, sit on a rocker in the back porch. It's where I take to him my questions, the inequities of life, or even God... I want to be used by you and I want to be available to you and I need for you to paint for me a picture that's different than the past. I go to the watch post, the place where I can encounter God. I want to invite you as you begin this year, go to the watch post, go to the tower, go to the place where you can meet God, to a place where you can find solitary, aloneness, And you can hear what God has to say to you. You know, there's something about vision that can be so compelling to us. When we capture this vision, when we see the vision, it can be so compelling and so drawing to us. It can create a future that's so different than what we've experienced so far. And vision is a powerful, powerful tool. In 1980, which a lot of you weren't even born in 1980, but in 1980... CBS, NBC, and ABC all had globe-spanning news divisions with hundreds of employees and each spent tens of millions of dollars annually to produce a 30-minute news broadcast. Each weekday, these news network programs would sign on, report the news, and sign off. Amazingly, not one of the big networks ever imagined anything more than a 30-minute news broadcast and the occasional news special or feature. But vision. Vision is what allows one to see the future as though it is the present. Vision is what allows one to challenge the status quo and challenge the way things have always been. Johnny Hunt said it this way, if you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. Ted Turner saw it. In Atlanta, Georgia, he had a big and bold vision for a different kind of news delivery. He envisioned something that most of us cannot imagine life without today, but it didn't exist in 1980. In June of 1980, as Ted Turner prepared to launch what was then called the Cable News Network, the first 24-hour delivery network we now know as CNN. Here's what he said. We won't be signing off until the world ends. We'll be on and we'll cover the end of the world live. (laughs) Vision. You can't see it unless you see it before you see it. Ted Turner, he saw it already. He envisioned it. I want to invite us to do something grander still. What Ted Turner had was a a dream, a man-made idea. Made him a very wealthy man. What I'm inviting us to do is to get a part of God's vision, to encounter God at our watch post, to get where we are with God and take all the inequities, all the unfairness, everything that we can't understand, or all of our vainness, all of our emptiness, all of the purposes that we feel like this isn't big enough, this isn't important enough, I don't feel like I belong, I don't feel like I matter. Bring that all to the watchtower. Bring that all to the watch post and say to God, I'm coming here to hear from you. The first thing that he did, the first step in the process for Habakkuk, was to go to the watchtower. You got to watch for the vision. You got to look for that future picture. The second thing that he did was he, the Bible says he wrote it. You got to write the vision. Verse two, isn't it interesting how practical God is? God says to him, I'm getting ready to give you the vision. And then he says, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. By the way, that phrase, make it plain on tablets, is the same phrase used for Moses to write the Ten Commandments. Put it on a tablet, write it down, chisel it in stone, make it obvious, write it on tablets. And then this phrase, so he may run who reads it. There's two interpretations of that. 
One interpretation is, so write it down so that everyone who reads it will be so compelled by the message that you've written that they can't help but run and go tell everybody what you've written. That's one interpretation. The other is, write it so plainly, so boldly, so obvious that even some, and I like this part, even somebody who's running by won't miss it. Make it so obvious that you don't have to explain it. You just put it out there where everybody can tell what it is. This is obvious. Make it plain. I actually think both interpretations have some validity. We want both. We want it clear, crystal clear, and we want it compelling. We want it so clear that somebody running by can see it. And we want it so compelling that it draws us into tomorrow. When God grants us the vision, when he says to us, hey, Danny, this is the picture of your future that I see. This is the portrait of who you are in the future. When I've gathered at my watchtower and he paints that picture for me, I need to write it down and I need to make it so clear and so compelling that I'm driven and drawn to it. And so are the people around me. I want to invite you. Let's do that. Let's write the vision. Even as a church, we need to do that. As a body of believers, as, as the people who call ourselves First Baptist Orlando, we need to rally around what is the picture, what's the portrait, what is it that God is painting for our future, and let's make it clear and compelling so that everybody can be marching in the same direction and everybody can be working with us to accomplish what that goal is. That is our prayer for us as a church, as your pastors, that God would write that vision. God would make it so clear to all of us. Making things clear and having a, writing it out, making it obvious for everybody is important. I found out this year how, how powerful that kind of imagery can be, writing it out, making it plain. About a year ago, as I was contemplating moving into 2013, I just felt challenged in my position at the church to, to challenge us as a staff to create margin within our operation budget. We have a lot of things here that... We, we can't plan on that happen without our planning, whether it's like you do at home, you know, your air conditioner breaks or something goes out or you need to repair this or whatever, and, or there, there are trips you want to take or things you want to do. Same thing happens at church. And yet, every year we'd kind of budgeted where we're already planning to spend 100% of what comes in. So I was just challenged with this idea. And it, I just, God painted this picture and I thought, I just don't know if we can do that. But, but I wrote down this phrase in one of my prayer times. I want to I wonder if we could figure out how to fund 12 months of ministry on 11 months of revenue and create a month worth of margin. Would there be a way for us to do that? How would that work? And I determined in my heart that 2013 was going to be the year to catch up financially. We were going to put some systems in place. We were going to be real efficient as a staff and in a way that the church family maybe couldn't even tell. But we were going to create efficiencies so we could catch up. And we could create margin, that we could have margin at church just like we all do at home to try to create margin for ourselves. So as I got ready for the first day of work in 2013, just about a year ago, I stopped at the store on the way to the office, and Don, bring me that. And I picked up three of these, three bottles, just like that. And I called our chief financial officer, Adam Moffitt, and I called Chris Friedman, our operations leader there, and I invited them to come see me as soon as I got to the office. And they came in to visit me and I said, guys, listen, I really feel like we need to move forward in 2013. It's the year to catch up. And, and what I want to do is I want us to create a system so that we can fund 12 months of ministry on 11 months of revenue. And 2013 is the year to catch up. So I want you to put this bottle of ketchup <laughs> in your office. And I want you to set it on a table where everybody that walks into your office can see it. And when they see that odd-looking bottle of ketchup in your office, you're going to be able to set it out and say, well, let me tell you what 2013 is. 2013 is the year to catch up. So I have a bottle on my desk to show ketchup. It's a reminder. You know what it was? I wrote it out. I put it on a banner. Everybody walking by saw it. I can't tell you how many days somebody would walk into my office and say, Danny, I've got this new thing we really want to do that, that we want to try to advance this thing and they're telling me all about this they want to do and I'm thinking to myself, I need to show them the ketchup bottle. 
And I just read back and put that catch up on them saying, hey, you know what? 2013 is the year to catch up. We're going to create margin in our budget. Now I know what you're asking. Well, how did you do? And so we didn't, we didn't hit 100% in 2013. But we got about halfway there. And I'm, I'm extremely excited to inform you that in 2014, we are funding 12 months of ministry on 11 months of revenue this year. And that extra revenue, that extra margin, yeah, you can applaud that. That's awesome. You're doing it. Again, it's not that that margin won't be used, but that margin will be used to take care of the items that we need to take care of, like fixing E2 and putting chillers in the building and repairing our sound system and other things that we need to have done that are uh-ohs that nobody could expect or plan for. But because we have margin, because our staff has led the way and found ways to do it, because of a silly ketchup bottle. When God encountered Habakkuk, he said, hey, write it down. Do you know something else he said to him? There's, a, there's an interesting twist. You know, I would have, if I were talking to Habakkuk, I might have switched it. I, if I were God, I would have said, let me tell you what the vision is. And then and now Habakkuk, don't forget to go write that down. But you know, that's not the way God did it. God said to him, write the vision. Now let me tell you what the vision is. In James chapter 1, there's a passage of similar nature where James is encouraging people to pray for wisdom. And then one chapter, excuse me, chapter 1 verse 6 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. James is saying, if you're asking God for wisdom, Habakkuk would say, if you're asking God for a vision, God would say, if you want to know my plan for you, don't be wavering. Don't be like a wave of the sea. You know what a wave of the sea is, right? On the top, it's moving real strong one direction. And then there's this undertow that moves it back in the other direction. You're like, yes, God, I'm in. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm going to. No, I don't think I am. Don't be like a wave of the sea. Be fully committed. There's something about writing it down, putting it on paper, where everybody can see it, including you, where you're selling tickets to it, right? You're giving a report. This is what I'm doing. It keeps you moving in that direction towards the vision that God has for you. Watch for it. Get to that place where God can speak to you and paint for you the picture of who he wants you to be. And then write it down. Buy yourself a ketchup bottle or whatever else you need to make it so plain that it's compelling to you and that even somebody running by can see it. Well, he watched for it. He wrote it. And the third thing in chapter 2, verse 3, the third step, wait for the vision. The vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. The beauty of embracing God's plan as opposed to asking him to embrace our plan is we can be sure he will accomplish it. Instead of us saying, God, here's what I'm thinking I need to do. Would you come bless this? It's better for us to say, God, paint me a picture of what my future is. And, and I'm going to write it down and I'm going to move towards that with everything that I have towards this picture that you're painting for me. And then I'm going to trust you to accomplish it. And do you know when we get about God's plan for us, do you know what, what the most frightening aspect is? It's usually something, maybe always something, we can't do alone. If I can do it, I don't need God. He wants to paint a picture for us that we can't do by ourselves. It takes him. It's, when we get to the place where we say, God, I, I see that picture. I, I see that, but I, I can't do that. I can't be that guy. I'm not bold enough or articulate enough or wealthy enough or influential enough. I'm not good enough or godly enough or, or smart enough. I can't be that person, God. I can't do it. I don't know how to raise my kids the way I'm supposed to, and I don't know how to be that influence at work, and, and I can't challenge the people the way somebody else does, and I can't be the witness that I'm supposed to be, and I can't give a lot of money, and I, I, I can't teach, and I, I, don't, I just don't, I don't know how I can do it. That 
that's exactly where God wants us. When we surrender and say, God, I see that picture. I've written it down, but I just don't see any way to get there. And that's when God says, it's his job. It's his responsibility. It's his joy to accomplish that work in us. This idea of waiting. I don't know if it's because I was raised in the land of theme parks, but I hate lines. Anybody else hate lines? I mean, I hate lines. If there's a line for food, I'm waiting. I'm going somewhere else. I just hate them. I just don't like it. Now they got the express pass thing. Now there's an express for, I mean, a line for the express pass. What good is that? I hate lines. I hate going to a restaurant where I'm going to pay money, right? And I sit down and I'm like, hey, what's up? I mean, I've been sitting here for 15 minutes and nobody's helping me. I can't get my drink order. What, let's, get, let's get on the road here. I hate waiting. And the Bible says we've got to wait on it. That's not a pleasant idea for me. I mean, so is it, is it really? I'm like, hey, God, okay, it's time. You've passed your appointed time. I'm here. I'm your guy. Let's get on with it, God. Or is it a line? Yeah, well, they're first. That's my turn. Okay, it's his turn. Let's keep. No. None of us like that. That's, I don't think that's the picture of what it means to wait on God. I don't think that's the way God intends it. Isaiah 40, 31, another passage that we're very familiar, talks about the strength that comes with waiting on God. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, it says. And, and we get renewed energy as we wait on God. For me, you know what that's like? You know the best comparison I can give you? Waiting on God is like what happens about a month or maybe three weeks before Christmas. It's the first morning I walk out of my bedroom past the Christmas tree, and I see a present under the tree that I haven't seen before. And I walk over to that present, and it's got my name on it. <laughs> and I go, wow, that's so awesome. There's a present under the tree for me. And I'm not one of those guys that likes to open my presents before Christmas. You give me a gift, you can rest assured, it will stay wrapped until Christmas. Because the joy for me is every single day I walk past that present and I get to look at it. And I know what we do, right? I go, now that matches the size and shape of something that I've been asking for. And I bet you that's that thing I've been asking for all year long and I'm finally going to get it. And every single day that passes, the anticipation builds, the anticipation builds, the anticipation builds. Or maybe it's, I look at it and go, hmm, I look at my list of stuff. I didn't ask for anything. I wonder, the mystery that's in that box, what could it be? And the waiting is not misery. The waiting is building anticipation for the day that, that little Shiloh, my three-and-a-half-year-old grandson, will bring that present to his Daddy D and say, Daddy D, this one's for you. And I get to tear open the present and see this wonderful gift that I've gotten. That's not a negative. Waiting is wonderful when we're waiting on the gift that somebody has given to us. And it draws me into that moment of Christmas. I'm just so compelled to be there. I so badly want to be gathered with the family on Christmas night because I want to be able to enjoy what I've been waiting for since it was put under the tree. That's the image that God has for us. When we get to that place in that watchtower and he paints for us this picture that's so different than our past. And we see something, we go, man, I don't know how I could be that. But if there's a way, God, that you can fit me into your grander scheme and you can make me more useful for you and you can use me to advance your kingdom. And it's not just about making money, but it's about me fueling the church and fueling the advancement of the gospel. And it's not just about me getting a promotion, but it's about me gaining favor so can I can have influence in more people and, and for the gospel's sake. And if you can somehow paint a picture and then I'm going to write it down, God, I'm going to be as descriptive as I can of that picture that you're painting for me. And I'm going to look at it. I'm going to put it on my desk. I'm going to put it on the bulletin board. I'm going to put it in my car. Everywhere I look, I'm going to write that vision so there's no doubting what I'm headed to. 
And then we let that vision draw us just like that present. That vision is drawing us, drawing us, drawing us, drawing us into the future that God wants for us. And I want to tell you today, that's what he wants for every one of us. To draw us into the future that he has planned for us. And as I close today, I want to share with you just a few moments as a church family. For those I know in a service like this, we have dozens that don't call First Baptist Orlando your church home. And we're thrilled that you're here, and I want to take an opportunity. I'm glad for you to listen to it as well, but I want to take an opportunity to speak to those who consider First Baptist Orlando your church. You attend here on a regular basis. This is the body of believers that you consider to be your church family. As your pastors, I want to issue to you a call. And Pastor David will be here next weekend. In the next two weekends, he'll talk to you about, talk to us about his word for the year and his theme for the year for us. And actually this year, our theme is going to move us into a vision that is unique and different than anything we've ever experienced. I am persuaded that the next few months will be some of the most pivotal times for the body of First Baptist Church Orlando. The future is right now. Our goal is to paint a picture for you that is so crystal clear and compelling that you will join us as we run fast to fulfill what God has for us here at First Baptist Church Orlando. In case you haven't been paying attention, the church in Central Florida, maybe everywhere, but especially right here in Central Florida, is under attack. God's men are under attack, and women, leaders, are under attack. The church needs revitalization. Our church needs a crystal clear and compelling vision for the future. And we are praying and asking God to grant it to us. In fact, as your pastors, we are going to the watchtower. We are going to the watch post. And today, I'm inviting you, the family of God at First Baptist Orlando, without exception, every one of us who call First Baptist Orlando our church home, to join us at that watchtower. And there are two simple ways that you can do it. I mean, maybe not simple. There are two effective ways that you can do it. One is, today, we begin a fast. You've heard about it a little bit for the last few weeks. Today, I want to call you to participate. If you're a part of First Baptist Orlando, I want to call you to, a, to participate. No exceptions. Students, adults, all ages, everybody can participate. That God would grant, pray that God would grant us and help us accomplish his vision for our church and our body of believers here at First Baptist Orlando. Orlando needs First Baptist to be who she needs to be in this community, to be a lighthouse here, a beacon here for the gospel. And we're committed to doing it. And we need you to be a part of it. I want to invite you. Join me for 21 days. Now, a few people, some in our prayer team, have committed they're doing a liquid-only fast for the next 21 days. If God would lay that on your heart to do it, I want to encourage you to do so. In our lobbies right after the service, there are members of the prayer team. There are some information sheets that you can pick up. The prayer team can provide you with tools and coaching and all on how to do a 21-day liquid fast. And if, again, if God would lay it on your heart, I would sure encourage you to do that. Some of our staff are participating in that as well. The second kind of fast that you could participate in is to do a, a partial fast. Pick something, some kind of, something that you normally eat and don't eat it for the next 21 days. Maybe you'd say, hey, I'm going to take a day of the week for the next three weeks and not eat on that day. Or maybe you'd say, I'm going to skip lunch for the next 21 days and not have lunch. I'm going to do breakfast and dinner. Or maybe you'd say there's a certain food that I like, like chocolates or ice cream or whatever a favorite food is, and you say, I'm going to do without this favorite food. This is not so that you can lose weight. That's missing the whole purpose of this. <laughs> okay? That's not, that may be an added benefit, and I don't have any problem with that, but the purpose is not weight loss. The purpose is that we will, num two things, fasting does this. Number one, the time that you normally spend eating or participating in some activity that you give up, you spend praying. The second thing is, there's nothing quite like being hungry to remind you to pray. 
And with the hunger pangs, you then say, hey, you know what? I'm supposed to be praying for what I'm supposed to do and what our church is supposed to be doing in the future. A third kind of fast is what we call a special fast. And this is giving up something other than food. Like maybe you want to give up a entertainment or recreation that you have. Maybe there's time of day or a certain weekend activity that you, other than church attendance. You'd want to give that up, but give up something else that you say, I'm going to give this up for the next three weeks. And in place of that, I'm going to pray for me and for our church. I want to encourage you to do that. Maybe it's television, giving up TV for a little while. Whatever it is, maybe it's internet. Maybe it's your mobile device. Whatever it is for the next three weeks, I want to invite you to do it. And then, the, so that's one thing, the fast. The second is this. On the 25th and 26th of this month, that's a Saturday and Sunday, the 25th and 26th of this month, we are inviting you to eat dinner on Saturday night, the 25th, but not to eat again, only liquid, until Sunday night. Sunday night, the information's on your bulletin on the right-hand side and one of the announcements there. On Sunday evening, we will gather together as a church body to corporately call on God and ask Him to meet us. We're going together to the watch post right here, and we're going to pray together for an hour. And at the conclusion of our prayer time that we have here in this room, we're going to walk over to Faith Hall together, and we're going to break the fast. We're going to have break fast for dinner that night. So dinner on Saturday night, pray all day Sunday. That, I understand Pastor David says he can preach till 2 o'clock because nobody's going to lunch that day anyway. <laughs> so um, be here that day, 25 and 26, to be a part of what God's doing here at First Baptist. You know the reality is? God's up to something. God is up to something that's beyond you and me. He's up to something that on the one hand, your pastors are, so, are saying to ourselves, we can't do that. We can't do that. And on the other hand, we're saying to ourselves, we can't not do that. We must advance. God is up to something. The worst tragedy would be that God does something in our midst and you were this close to it and you didn't participate. You didn't get in on that vision, on that beautiful picture of what God wants to do with us in this community and around the world. And I want to invite you, be a part of it. It's, in fact, in Habakkuk, in the first verse, God said something to him that I would say to you today. God said in verse 5 of chapter 1, he said, Look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded. I'm a, I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. I'm telling you right now, God is doing some things. There's an undercurrent moving that if I told you, you wouldn't believe me of what he's going to do with us. He's painted a picture between next Sunday and Easter you don't want to miss. We'll be spending those three or four months talking about this wonderful plan that God has for us as a body of believers called First Baptist Orlando. And I want to invite all of us to be a part. And let's, let's see that vision. Let's see that present, that picture that God has for us. That word for pant, it says it hastens to the end. It's the same phrase that's used in Psalm when it says that I, I long for you, God, like the deer pants for water. It's this idea that when God paints this vision for us and we've written it down crystal clear that no matter what, we're panting, we're moving, we're going, we're not stopping. No matter what, will we stop moving towards the vision that God has for us? And church family, I invite you, let's be a part of his vision for us.